I should stand here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me just take this then and this. <laughs> Oops. Um, very good evening. Uh, my name is I do the finance area. Uh, it's a great honor to welcome Professor Darius Pallia uh, for today's uh, seminar. As you know, he's uh, you know the uh, professor at the uh, University of Rutgers, and uh, he's also the Rendon Window Chair in Banking and uh, Banking. That's banking. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, he has a very distinguished career. Uh, he has uh, been a faculty at uh, Princeton, Columbia, University of Chicago, and UCLA, uh, names that we really want to be part of. Um, he is also an associate editor at uh, JFQ, General of Management and Quantitative Analysis. Um, his research spans uh, law and uh, finance mostly, uh, and also on executive compensation and related topics. He has published. Um, Many papers across um, the top ranked journals in economics and finance include the Amber Finance, American Economic Review, and uh, several more as uh, self related. Uh, he's going to share with us today a very exciting paper about how the Dodd Frank Act uh, has impacted uh, payers sensitivity in banks and how does it translate into equity risk of these banks, if at all. And um, let's uh, hear from him. On this paper. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, good to see everyone here. Uh, I have to say, when I was studying in my undergraduate in Mumbai, this was hallowed grounds. I am Ahmedabad, people would say, Are you going there? And I said, No chance of getting in. <laughs> so it's nice to come back and see all these young faces and some older faces. <laughs> all right, so that said, um, this paper is interesting because for the first time, uh, I, I learned both a new technique, uh, and so I'll explain why a new econometric technique and why I think it can be used in different policy experiments and why this experiment gives some very intriguing results. There's a puzzle at the end, and we'll talk about the puzzle. Don't feel shy. Uh, if you have any question, just put up your hand, okay? Or just say, excuse me, all right? So, what happened? Ah, huh. so let's just start with what we are looking at. Okay, so when we look at executive compensation in usually in finance, we say there are two things. One is how does the pay vary for a one percent increase in stock price? That's called delta. Okay, and the other is vega, which is how does the CEO's compensation change for a 1.01 change in its stock return volatility. So that's sort of established in the literature. It's a sort of definition. And there are ways to calculate it. It's not complicated. So the thing about Vega, though, theoretically, I'm not, this is not my research. The the relationship between pay and, I mean, risk and vega, it theoretically can go either way. Okay, and what it is is, if we just put it in certainty equivalent terms, it's the expected wealth minus the risk premium, 
And so you get these terms, but it depends on the shape of the utility function. Okay, and so Steve Ross has this nice paper. And so basically, uh, if you bring down all the math, the convexity of the compensation plan, okay, is can be offset by the concavity of the CEO's utility, theoretically. So it's really an empirical issue, which one dominates. Okay, so we all know, we don't really know the CEO's utility function, yeah? So that's why in the literature, at least, and it's also there in general corporate firms, not just banks, that depending on the paper, you can get whatever result you want. Okay, and you can see this. So there's, okay, so that's one. So why did we want to look at the Dodd-Frank Act? Because the Dodd-Frank Act was largely in the beginning, you know, due to this compensation. It's a huge act. It was about credit ratings. It was, you know, what are the role of, uh, it's called the Volcker rule, which is how much you can trade. But we're going to just hire, take one part. And that's why this technique is really useful because it isolates one part. And you can think of other applications too. And I'll explain the technique. So basically you can see that this is subsumed by the larger Dodd-Frank Act. Okay. Now, so the model we are going to use, I'm going to, without putting all the technical stuff, I'm going to explain it in just the idea. Okay, so it's based on, it's not ours, we are borrowing it from a recent paper in the AER by Juraleva. Okay. And we all know what a diff and diff is, right? So this is a generalized diff and diff, and I'll explain what a generalized. So I'll put it in medical trials stuff, forget ours, because that's where we borrowed diff and diff for. Okay. So in a standard diff and diff, you've got two groups of patients who are supposed to be similar in health characteristics. Now, in reality, they might not be identical or close. Because what's missing in those studies, they have not checked if genetic things are different. So there could be actually a lot of omitted variables. Later on, we might find that these were, you know, we thought were identical. But in any case, with all those problems, so the treated group is given the drug and the control group is given a placebo, right? That's a general. And then we say, ah, this is the, what's the net effect, correct? So we check for the efficacy of the drug. Is that clear? The generalized is, there's a assumption, of course, the math gets a little complicated, but the two groups of patients are a priori going to be separated on something. So it would be like, you know, these patients are more severely affected by cancer. These patients are less severely affected by cancer. Okay, now we give a drug, we, a priori, you're thinking why this is, and then you check if the difference is there. So the, that's the basic idea. So it's not like a control and a treat, okay? So that's based. It's not a treatment. Yeah. So uh, is the stable treatment, is the stable unit treatment value is actually not No, it will, you have to test for that. You have to test for the parallel trend, right? So that still will, you'll have to test. But, uh, but there's some part of some assumptions about the A prior, certain distributions, then this solution will not 
map. Okay, so it has to like, if you have heavy tails or something like that, the methodology is inappropriate. Okay, but the parallel trend still helps. So, so is the idea clear? Just methodological without all the math. Okay. So in her paper, actually it's, what she tests is there was a ban on the word. So the, in, in the US, uh, one of the disseminators of information is called the Associated Press. And the Associated Press is a feeder news organization to all of newspapers. So there was a short ban on the word illegal immigrant. Okay. So then they had a treated, I mean, a more severely affected possibility. She mapped it to more red state type of things, more blue state. And she found during that ban, the and then she surveyed all the attitudes towards immigrants that ban had an effect of making it less uh less antagonistic towards that that's that paper okay but it's nothing i'm just borrowing the method the math okay so what are we going to do so here's using that methodology dot frank now, what is our prior? Remember, I was saying there's the more severely affected and a less severely affected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this vega and I'll split it into two groups. Before Dodd-Frank, those that had a high vega. Okay, that means the pay risk relationship was very high. So because of their pay, the, the risk is high, but the correlation is high. Now, and then if there's a low pre, we call it low pre vega zero. And then the treatment, the drug effect or the treatment is dot frank. So we're going to look at how does that in the, so the good part about this methodology is you've got dot frank, but in the first stage, what you're doing is, you are taking at the difference between this high pre vega and low pre vega. So, on compensation. So, in the first stage, you're looking at did how did Dodd Frank change compensation? And then we use that fitted value into risk. Is the point clear? So, so the first. So, forget this method. It's almost like a two stage least squares in some sense. Okay, and so there's a so you'll see effectively it's an instrument, and if you don't find a difference in the first stage between these two groups, then you've got a weak instrument problem. Okay, so that's the drug. So that's a prior, and these are the two groups. As a robustness test, because always I get this, you split it into two groups. What if it's a continuous? All the results hold. Okay, so it's not because it's two groups. So, so here is the first stage. Okay, so what we are doing is it's a panel data. So this is, let's say, bank I in year T. They uh, compensation and the variable you're interested in is this beta. So you notice it's high pre vega times dot frank. That's going to be in the first stage. Okay. For the xi variables, it's just the two we picked size and capital structures, so just control variables. But importantly, it's a fixed effect model. That is, every bank gets a dummy. So we are, what are we doing? We are sort of throwing away cross-sectional variation, and we are just looking at within firm variation or within bank variation. Okay. The capital structure is a square bit measure or the 
regular capital. No, no, it's asset the risk. Uh, what do they call it? Risk RWC, risk weighted assets. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference. Both of them, it's fine. Okay, and then we got year dummies. So the dot franc is the pre period is 2000 to 2009, a robustness test. It goes from 2000 to 2007. We dropped 2008, 2009. All the results go through. So it's not this being driven by 2008, 2009. Okay. And then the year dummies. So the bank level fixed OPEX look already. So this is her model. Okay. I mean, it's not. Uh, you know, so it uh, just absorbs the independent effect, and the year dummies also absorb the independent effect. Okay. So the that's the first stage, and now you'll see the second stage. The second stage, we will have one or two. The Y variable will be different measures of bank risk uh, or performance. And that fitted value from the first stage is this thing, okay? So in some sense, if I go back here, if you ask what's the instrument, the instrument for that is high pre-vega times dot frank and this beta, okay? So that's a way of, after all the econometrics thinking about it. Is that clear? Okay, so here is, so we're going to use different measures of bank risk. Okay, we can use, our main one is this, yes. Yes. Um, so essentially the two stage model is necessarily taking what adjustment did as an outcome of the dot frank act? Uh, right. So the first thing. How does it impact the bank? Right. So, but only that part that it affects see your compensation. Everything else is thrown away. It's right. Exactly. Exactly. So you'll see uh, that we use a lot of proxies. Okay. So one good part about this paper, whatever results we have, it's not knife edge. That is one, sometimes you run four variables and two show up or significant and two don't for the same sort of idea. Here, if it's insignificant, it's insignificant for all four. Okay, so that just happens to be. Okay, so, so the first thing is, what is the act? Okay, now I have to say reading this act gave me a headache, okay, because these guys, lawyers just keep going on and on and on. But luckily, there was a, one of these law firms had summarized somewhere something. So I could hone it on that. <laughs> okay. But basically, first, who does it apply to? It applies to the, diff, some rules apply to what they call level one banks, which is over 250 billion. Level two banks, which are 50 billion to 250 billion, this is all not market cap. This is asset size. Okay. And level three. Our sample is largely level one and level two, I have to say. Now, in the United States, there are about 3,000 banks. Okay. But when you look at the sample, the ones that trade are only about two, 300 but it's about 95%. So in, in essence, there is a bias that everything we do is, on one hand, it's looking at 95% of banking assets. On the other hand, what about all those that don't trade? Okay, because FDI, that's where the runs can happen, et cetera. So I just want to say, if, that is a problem for all papers and banking, which only focus on, which uses stock returns. Okay. So I don't know if you know these measures of systemic risk, like COVAR or MES of Acharya and all these guys, they're all based on 
uh, stock returns. But what about those 2,000 odd banks that are not rated? Are you saying they have no systemic risk? So that the regulators know that your faculty keep doing your research and happily ignore this big chunk because we don't know how to use accounting to get to that. Okay. Isn't there some stickiness in the compensation? Is it rewriting the contracts? Some old contracts would be grandfathered. Yes, there is stickiness, but remember the stickiness part, that fixed effect, will is anyway thrown away. So if we are just looking at how it varies over time. And so we are taking those. So in some sense, um, unfortunately, at least in all corporate research, the methodology is throwing away all cross-sectional relations as of today. Now, some new method can come uh, and change all that. But because there are so many omitted variables, the fixed effects models are the right now the prevailing sort of art of state of the art. But you're effectively throwing out a lot of variation. Okay. What is there? Okay, yeah. So basically, this was how they start off. Okay, they say the uh, act. This is actually prohibits incentive compensation that encourages inappropriate risks by providing excessive compensation or could lead to material financial loss. Okay, so you can see in law, they want to define it as broadly. And then it's the lawyer's job to what they call def uh, define the four corners of the document. Okay. That's what they say. So the next thing gets more specific. Okay. So they actually say we want it to be more performance oriented and long term and less convex. So now they are getting a little more. What do they mean by this? So now we can look at the different components and try to create some testable hypothesis. Okay. So more performance oriented and less convex, we looked at all the variables uh, and we said, ah, the first is long term is, supposing, you, does everyone know what restricted stock is? There's a stock given which you can't sell for some period of time. So that makes it more, long term okay and less in options and options are highly convex so that was easy okay so hypothesis two actually we we didn't think of before till we saw the different components in the data and the departments had this vesting now vesting is after some time you can buy and sell for some time you can't buy and sell in both options and in restricted stock, and they give you the criteria, okay? And so some are performance-based vesting. That means if you reach so-and-so amount in profits or sales or something, you can vest, okay? The other was time-based vesting. Okay? And to be, like I said, we didn't have a clue this was going on till we saw the compensation contracts. So time-based vesting is after three years, you can vest, independent of performance. After two years, it can vest. So if it's more performance-oriented, we would want performance-based vesting. If it's less, these are just a priori hypotheses. Okay, more long-term oriented, they have something called long-term incentive plans, okay? And so we expect that to increase. And now in the US, you have deferred comp. Okay. And so here they said, Dot Frank said for larger banks, you can defer four year deferral. And for sort of, uh, of at least less than three years and two year deferral, 
of incentive terms, CEO incentive for at least three years. Okay, so, so what we expected is that the dollar amount in a deferred comp to increase, okay? Because they want you to postpone everything. Not, no short-term stuff. This is all after the crisis. They felt everything was too short-term. Is that clear? Now, there was uh, one of the things of having co-authors is co-authors have disagreements. Okay. So actually, we had data on clawbacks. One of the co-authors says, I don't believe it. So I lost the argument. So I... The clawbacks are, if you don't do well, you can pull something back. And actually, just so you know, the results show that the incidence of clawback provisions increase like crazy after that. I'm not saying they're clawing it back. It's just put into the contract that you, if you do something bad. Okay, but bonus uh, was... Uh, we expect bonus things to decrease because they felt people were getting bonuses independent of anything. Okay. Now, this was very specific, and this was a shock to all quarters. We didn't know that CEOs could hedge their position. <laughs> so I still don't know if this is... Uh, was this like, uh, what do you call it, shooting at a, a bird that doesn't exist? Because there were no papers saying in banking or in corporate that when the CEO got a lot of shares, he or she was hedging it by buying some derivatives. Have you seen any paper? No, at least in the US. But they put this in. And what you'll see in the data, the anti-hedging provisions jumped like crazy. So every bank started having a lot of anti-hedging, okay? Just the provisions, not that, okay. So these are the hypotheses, huh? Zero one, yeah, exactly. So the data is bank holding companies. It's called SIC code standard. The pay data is from two sources. Now, just one thing, since there are PhD students here, People think that if you use Execucomp and Incentive Labs, you're only looking at the largest. You're not. Okay, you're basically looking at the S&P 500, the S&P mid-cap 400, and the S&P small-cap 600. So it's actually quite... Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, this is on the stickiness. Uh, yeah. Now, would you trade uh, or how do you trade that? Let's say an existing compensation, the, the details are you versus a new plan is rolled out. We ignore that. That's the truth. We just say as if in, in a year, I mean, in a bank, uh, all the time variation is, uh, so the two banks, identical uh, compensation structure. Let's say one is one contract going down 10 years. Another is three contracts every Three, four years, we just ignore. But that's a valid issue. Uh, no. Working an existing one is more. I agree. I agree. I agree. But we we don't do that mainly because of one reason. If we have to do that, we have to hand collect data. <laughs> so it's like it's not there like this is a new contract, not a new contract. Okay, so but that's valid. Hirings could be used. Huh? Hirings could be used. You see what won't make a big difference. The hirings won't make a difference. I've done some other research. The the thing about hirings is uh, you do something called forced turnover. Forced turnovers is where everything is there, but it's a small part. So when you know, so it's like nine. I don't know the exact number for banks, but let's say ninety-five percent people retire normally. 5% people are kicked out, okay? So when you run any of these large sample studies, that 5% doesn't sort of get represented, even though it's a very important 5%, okay? So, yes. Anecdotal evidence of 
was being discussed in the financial press. So, uh, you mean the turnover? Uh, of the, of Frank Ag the compensation. Oh yeah, there's, there was a lot. There was a lot. And in fact, one of the good parts of being close to New York City, we know big firms who do this. It was, because in the end, who's employing the big firm? The CEOs, what do they care about? Their compensation. So by definition, all the towers, parent, these are all big compensation consulting firms. This was number one on the radar because the CEOs care, you know, because it's their, their money. It would be like asking, Thirub, I'm sorry, Mukesh Ambani, what, what is your salary? You think Mukesh doesn't care because Mukesh cares. Every consultant to Reliance will care. <laughs> it's the same thing. Okay. All right. So financial statement data, CompuStat, stock returns, the usual culprits. So there's one thing. In 2006, they added deferred comp and anti-hedging in disclosure. So if you can see from 2000 and 2006 to 2005, there's no data on deferred comp. Okay, so whenever I'm putting the results for those two, it's a smaller sample, okay? But you can see here that these are small sample of unique banks when 3,000 banks, but that's about 90, 95% of the banking system, large. So let's first see um, okay. Let's first see just the actual. Now there are all those control variables, bank effect. So let's explain the table. This is the why each component of compensation. Okay, so you got bonus. So this is one regression, stock, options, LTIP. Okay, so you can clearly see that what happens to bonus. This is not asking, this is the first stage for each one. It's saying, did Dodd Frank change the difference between the high pre vega and low pre vegas compensation so the first one is did it change bonus so yes bonus went down okay did it change stock went up did it change options it did okay did it change ltip it did. So this is not saying how did this affect risk or performance. So the weak instrument problem doesn't exist. So what they said they wanted to affect, they affected. Okay. So now we go in a little more into this. Okay. So in, in uh, the US, the compensation data is given in a proxy statement and the main table in what the proxy statement is called DEF for the definite form 144A, this is the first table. Then they go into more. And so the, the uh, data is also set up like that. Okay, so now there we said bonus went down, Stock went up, options went down, LTIP. But now we can go in a little more. Okay. So now we look at this performance, et cetera. Okay, so the first thing is we are looking at this performance vesting and time vesting. But the interesting thing is, there's a substitution going on, but not from just all time vesting to performance. If you notice, time vesting options went down like crazy, but nothing happened to time vesting stock. It was a complete substitution from time vesting options to performance vesting stock, restricted stock. 
Okay, so that was, you know, and the weird part about this, I have a friend who works for one of these um, compensation consulting firms. When I told him this result, he said, I could have told you so. And said, you guys spend all these years doing all this stuff. I don't know what you do. And it was a little annoying, I have to say. But he was a friend, so I, I just kept quiet. But, you know. So, so the first thing we start seeing is that basically we are starting to see that this Dodd-Frank Act change banking compensation the way you would think they wanted it to go. And having written quite a bit about laws and stuff, I was a little shocked because for the first time I'm getting results where the regulator says this and consistent with that, it happened. Usually it's this and then, so I have a paper in the Journal of Financial Economics about credit ratings and basically credit ratings got more negative because of the regulators, and guess what? Markets did not react to when you got that because they were saying they're just doing this so it was less informative, okay? I'm not finding any of those type of unintended consequences yet. So it was a little, both Chris, my co-author from Florida, and me were like shaking our head, going like, there must be something they did wrong. Because that's how we are. <laughs> okay, so that's what I was trying to say. More restricted stock, more performance vesting in restricted stock. Less options, and more importantly, less time vesting options. Okay, so that's... So other compensation structures... So I was a little surprised. They make a big deal about deferred comp, nothing. Okay. So no, nothing changed in deferred comp, nothing changed in pensions. Now, David Earmack and all these guys have in corporate, they call it inside debt. Okay. And inside debt is just the sum of, not in banks, in just general company, is the sum of deferred comp plus pensions. Okay, just so you know. Okay, uh, because Jensen and Meckling long time ago used this word inside debt. So they said this. But you can see this big coefficient in anti-hedging going up. Now, if you actually ran one more column here, clawbacks went up like crazy the provisions, again, one zero, okay, just the provisions. So this is what's going on in the comp first stage, okay? So we also, you know, there are too many tables, so I just, it's in the paper in a footnote saying we tried vesting periods of restricted stock. Did it get longer? Yes. So, uh, we also take data on uh, high water marks, existing stock. The high water. Yes. No, they do not give that for banks. Yes, but back, but no. No, this is just asking Barney whether they have a clawback or not. They are not saying what type of clawback, what it is, none of that. It's just a clawback on one yes, no. Okay. So the vesting periods, nothing changed. And this is your stickiness. Okay. So uh, so we went in saying, wait a minute, we went to some banks and what we found is before, if they were giving three years vesting period before, they were giving three years vesting period after. Okay. And it continues, there's some arbitrariness, why they pick, some will take three and stay with it, some will take five and stay with it, but nothing changed. So remember, 
all these results are we are looking within bank. So it's all we are throwing out cross sectional, but for the first time we were like, okay, there we are looking at the difference between high pre vega and low pre vega, and how that difference changes due to dot frank, correct? But I want we just wanted to see cross sectionally in the year before Dodd Frank, who are these high pre vega folks? Bank just to get an idea, okay? And guess what? It's it's large banks. So that was like the biggest banks. And if you see this now, he also this is. This is the banks. This is just the ranking. The top 15 banks in the year just before Dodd Frank. So, who's who of the largest banks? The low pre Vega ranked by the lowest to the highest is small banks. But what we realize is this is recently we had a crisis in banking, and that was interest rate risk, the SVB banks. Guess what? Two of the banks were here. So in the low risk category, so I'm not saying this is just casual empiricism. Okay, and when we, this is just the top 15. If you go to top 20, there's SVB bank in this lowest group. So something else is going on in the interest rate risk measure, which is related. There was nothing about interest rate risk in Dodd-Frank. Okay. So I don't know what's going on, but here's your Signature Bank. That's one of those. There's First Republic and somewhere here between 15 and 20 was a Republic. Uh, so this was just a surprise. You know. So, so in some sense, we are now asking, remember, we are giving each bank a dummy. So these cross-sectional differences are kicked out. Okay. Now, so now comes the second stage. So we are taking that first stage, remember, instrumented by Dodd Frank and High Pre Vega. The low pre vega is on the median. Uh, it's yeah, based on the median. But if we did the same thing, remember on continuous, you'll get the same thing. Okay, so oops. So the so the first thing, these are again different regressions. So bank risk in this table is just volatility. Okay, of stock. And the way to interpret this is if it's going to be the same sign change as what you got in the first. So what did we say? Bonus went down. So therefore, this was saying risk goes down. Is that clear? So we said LTIP is long-term incentive plans went up. So if it goes up, it's got this negative sign here. So that means risk goes down. Okay, so that's how you can say. So throughout what we have, oops, we are supposed to throw out this ratio. That's a good point. <laughs> this is some, again, internal. I like something he does. They don't like something I get outvoted. In. So, um, so basically, throughout we are finding risk goes down. Okay, which is what they wanted. But here comes the puzzle. So bank risk goes down. I'm like, hallelujah. So the regulators for the first time did something which was shocking to a lot of us. They did something correctly. Okay, with no, but there's no change in bank performance. We threw the kitchen sink at this. Okay, we threw. 
So you see, nothing significant. So here, Tobin's Q, we threw in Farmer French Alpha, we threw in ROA, we threw in five factor Farmer French Alpha. So risk goes down and the market doesn't do anything about it. Yes. I was thinking, I mean, correct me if I'm getting it wrong. Uh, is it that the dot Frank Act has a powerful far reaching and wide implications for the way in which bank holding companies are run? And those reforms uh, will have an impact on your asset side. And therefore, the company can be in the big impact of the dot, correct? And of course, when you're expecting those businesses to be, you know, Sizing them down, right. down, then you can also adjust your compensation structure. Therefore, both are occurring simultaneously rather than compensation working to impact their no, but but and their uh, no, no, but the okay, so this structure is causal, right? Because when you say you have a shock, have a shock so that is not. What I thought you were going to was saying, clearly the risk went down, but the market saying banks are crap anyway. So no risk, the stock price didn't go up, but ROA didn't change too. So that's what yeah, is what surprised. Yes. Is it possible that you're right. And you know, how index Right. That could be. That's specifically playing a game where they're bringing down risk now. The market becomes that product is a shock over the time they're in the game. That's very possible. That's where we haven't tested for that. Okay. Yeah, the return. I mean, you know, we trust me, we threw the kitchen sink. I was like, there's a eight factor hedge fund factor of essay. I said, let's try that. It was not one close to significance. And, but it could be that. So, we, you have a sort of, you know, clarity on what is a why media. Yeah, yeah. It a yeah, yeah, it is a mystery. That's why I said, you know, the right now we're just fishing, you know. Which possibility, and while presenting it, uh, you know, but it's very clear that the markets, like nothing performance wise, has not either gone down because of Dodd Frank or gone up. True, because compensation changed. And the, we don't know. Okay, so now, uh, So this is what I was trying to say. All the different return stuff. This is like a subset, truthfully. Okay. Now, there's one question here is, we were saying, okay, this difference made risk go down. Is it because the low pre-Vega guys changed or did the high pre-Vega which chairs change? And guess what? This is the high pre-Vega guy. Okay, so you'll see that. So we just first calculate this, you know, and then just do a usual asset pricing type of two by two thing. And you will see it's all driven by this large pre-Vega, pre-period, large bank sort of thing. They reduce their risk. Okay. And the market gave them neither a penalty nor a premium. <laughs> I wish I was in behavioral finance. Then I could cook up some reason. I shouldn't say that. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, so here comes the robustness test. So I thought we sort of reverse causality okay so one of the things is you know we are saying we could say hey how do you know volatility is not causing compensation to change 
right? We're using idiosyncratic one. So the trick here is, and this is for PhD students, the easy way to do it is take sample wallet. Why should sample volatility change an individual bank's uh, vega? Okay, so now the results change. So it's not being driven by individual volatility. Okay, this is a simple thing. So that's uh, the second one is I told you, you know, is it being driven? Because I have to tell you, that, uh, 2008, September 15th, when Lehman went, is it all being driven by 2008, 2009? So we just threw those two years out and, and everything holds. Okay, so that's holds. Now, there is a research issue, which if you solve, you've got a good paper. But the reason I'm telling you this is because I can't solve it. Otherwise, I won't tell you because I could solve it. If you not look at banks, if you calculate, forget pre-delta, if you take delta and vega of two firms, of a firm, across all execucom firm, the correlation is going to be 0.96. So in the entire literature to date that is published, even though they say it's delta, it could be vega. The papers that say Vega, it could be dealt. No one knows how to solve. That's the topic. Okay. So uh, we use something, use pre-delta, but that's, you know, in my view, there's no significant effect, but this is a, just happens to be in the, so if I take the 20 papers on Delta, and stick in Vega in there, I'll get the same results. And it's a completely different interpretation. Okay, that's just. And then we said, wait a minute, this is the counterfactual. What's so special about Dodd-Frank? Let's take something. So we luckily have this paper by Rene Stolzinov on 1998, Russian crisis, and there's nothing. Compensation didn't change, nothing. So we're sort of happy about all this with that one big puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't the market, uh, you know, risk goes down, returns didn't go down. First principles of finance, risk and return are correlated. So we don't know. So in both stages. Yeah. So, yeah. so there, is there a possibility that, uh, you know, in a way, what the way I would interpret and Okay, sure. That, uh, you know, seeing the compensation contract. Uh, being changed, the investor now see that there is less performance in the rest of the bank. Right. right. Would there be a difference uh, across if one were to maybe you come back if possible? In what the, way? Uh, kind of holdings, uh, who holds the shares? Who holds the shares? We didn't try. So you're saying the shareholder clientele it depends. We didn't try. It could be, but I have no you know, yeah, exactly. So I don't know about that. Um, yeah, it could be, you know, so I, off the top of my head, uh, I don't know. Like, I, so, you know, it's all been driven by this large banks, right? So you know, did large bank clientele become more retail investors or more institutional investors? I don't know, but we could check. That's that's the data is there, so we could check. Yes. The banks we start the we've controlled for that. Okay, so this is net of it. The risk based capital we put that there, so that didn't change. You know, we just, we didn't analyze it. We just threw it into a, into that and, uh, and said, after accounting for that, we get this. 
So, you know, we were all happy saying we've got everything and then that suddenly the returns came and then we were like, yikes, you know. So we still have this one issue, I think, if the referee jumps on it, we haven't yet sent this, I'm presenting it at a few places. Uh, we'll have to, I think we have to sort it. <laughs> You know, oh, at least have some conjectures. One could be we could look at the shareholder clientele. Uh, oops. So, did it change? And to my surprise, yes. So, the regulators got what they intended. Okay. So, how did it change? Well, more performance, vesting restricted stock more LTIPs and a lot of anti-hedging. And remember my favorite, more clawbacks, even though it's not that. It's like my sub, against my co-authors, I'm disclosing it. <laughs> less time vesting and less options and bonus. And because of this, oh, there's no changes in these other variables, but because of those, we're finding lower bank volatility. Okay, and we can throw in all types of uh, volatility measures and it's being driven by this large bank high pre vega group. Okay. And then the puzzle, why returns didn't change. Yes. Okay, so when you, when, no, when you run a fixed effects model, what it's running actually, just when you run, it's not volatility. What, so supposing you've got 10 years of data, it actually is called mean differences. So it takes, so supposing you're taking Citicorp, Citicorp's average volatility, okay, and each year, Citicorp's actual volatility minus average volatility. Now you'll get the same result if you do that so that's not done by me that's if you run it in stata but if you program first differences so sigma it minus sigma it minus one without an intercept term you'll get the same thing as mean difference so you're not running sigma i okay that's the fixed effects model so you can see that you're effectively removing the sigma i the average volatility out. That's what you mean by the cross-sectional variations thrown out. And the first test you do in panel regressions, you do an ANOVA in STAIR, and you see the variables you will see in not in everything that's based on uh, prices, stock returns, whatever, will have high time variation. So when you do an ANOVA, it will give you the analysis of variance due to time, and analysis of variance due to cross-sectional differences. Everything, just this is just econometrics. And the, whenever it's an accounting variable, most of it will be cross-sectional. Whenever it's stock returns, you'll get much more variable. Okay, so that's just... Yeah, but 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 that's what this is running, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so if I take sigma i t minus sigma i t minus one is equal to sigma i t minus sigma bar ba i. If you run these, if you run the first without an intercept, you'll get the same beta. So that's what I'm running. When you say I'm running a fixed effects, you're not running sigma i. Is that clear? You're running mean differences. Okay. All right. So um, you had. Maybe 
so that they still get that. That's also a good point. No, we didn't check anything. So what you're saying... Is there any measure of uh, the... I mean, of course, the skinness of the assets carving are going to be some form of the risk-weighted assets. Yeah, the risk-weighted... No, but that's risk-weighted capital. Not act, not the we didn't play anything with it's the, the level can remain the same. Why can we let it is? Uh, the validity of the ROI comes back. All right, all right. Yeah, and I think that's we have to think is there any because I don't know, uh, is there any candidates you would suggest we test on the asset side? L like, no, yes. All right. Still, a lot of other markets were also hit. US this. So that I see. Yeah, we have not done anything of that, but we I, I'll start looking at the assets in more, you know, but that might explain that. That's thank you, both of you. you know. Because it's just been racking my brain, and so has Chris. You know, what, what to do now? Do I have some time, or am I done? Yeah, five, ten. Five, five, ten. Because I want to tell about one more separate topic because it's exciting. It's with Amyotosh Purnanan. So, what we did was we looked at fintech folks and i know that's why i want to bring it up because i heard there's a lot of fintech interest but these are fin in the us you can there are a lot of fintech real estate mortgage firms the one with the biggest share now rising the most is called rocket mortgage and rocket mortgage you can get on your phone put in 10 minutes later you got your mortgage. So this intrigued us to say, actually it's with a PhD student who collected a lot of the data. So I said, are they giving, you know, this? So all of us have applied for mortgages. It takes a long time. You have to fill all these forms. There's all this stuff. So traditional banks are doing it. And these guys are coming in and just doing it like in 10 minutes, you got a mortgage. So the first question was, are they giving higher risk or low risk mortgages? That was the first question. So in the US, you have a database called Humda, which is basically collects all the data. And we found that the FinTech firms were doing it, borrowers had higher loan to value, which means they're putting less down payment in a fintech firm, less conventional loans. The borrow income was lower, average borrower, so all high risk. Okay, so that was the first result. So we said, okay, but is it coming from capital structure? So that was the new thing. And the capital structure of a bank, if you're a traditional bank, uh, capital is about 12 to 14 percent. The rest, a big part is deposits. And deposit franchise, as you know from the papers by Drexler and all this, is very sticky. So they have a constant source of capital, which is on paper, will never leave them. And in short term, but in reality, is like long-term debt because people don't move. But these guys, fintech firms, don't have access to that because they're not a bank. So the first thing we did was let's get their financials. To get those financials, we have to file what's called a Freedom of Information Act. So you file these legal things saying, and then you get the financials. They have to disclose once you file that with some. And the first thing we notice, all the financing is coming from selling the loans, mortgage-backed security. To whom? To Fannie and Freddie. So now I'm like, here we go again, you know. <laughs> we had that subprime crisis where, you know, all these are going to Fannie and Freddie and they're selling it to Fannie and Freddie. Okay. Because now in the U.S., 
all mortgage backed secure, 96% is Fannie and Freddie. The what's called private label market is non exist. And the question we are, the one question we don't know is who's buying, now Fannie and Freddie securitize it and sell it. So who's buying these bonds backed by fintech assets? It's high risk. Is it the, so that's an exciting project to me. But I, I have a meeting when I go back with a fintech guy and I'm going to try to ask him nicely, like he's the saint, although I know his industry is the one causing <laughs> high risk as to who's buying these bonds. Because if it's a pension fund, then the government can't let that pension fund go. So again, they're going to bail this thing out. If it's a hedge fund holding this, let it go. So that's I don't know. I mean, in India, we have an equivalent of something called priority circle lending. Uh -huh. So banks can actually buy out this portfolio to really qualify. You, you don't want to originate yourself. Right. You acquire it and still qualify. So, but then why don't people just keep giving high risk loan and tell bank because to buy bank buy it out and then you're expensive. No, no, I understand. But what I'm saying is, supposing I'm a entrepreneur in India, and I know banks want to grow like this. Just give it. Someone comes in asking for one crore loan. You say take two crores. Don't care if it's a panwala or whoever. Right? And then the Hopefully, the bank will buy me, and it's no more my problem. That, that's the risk. I'm not saying that's what happens, but that's what we are trying to see. In the US, it's more sophisticated. Is that what's happening? I don't know, because basically, if, if, it's, if the bonds are going to be held by pension funds, it's an implicit guarantee by the government. So one side they're saying, I'm giving you FDIC insurance. The other side, the bond, the, the buyer is going to be bailed So we don't know that. So that's sort of an exciting topic for me. Standard EID is the one kind of that the general statement should not have a general equilibrium effect on the state. Yes. How does it play here? Here too, it's the, I think I didn't put that up. You can have, it's a little more complicated. So in general DID, you're looking for this parallel trend assumption, right? So was there a trend before? So that if there was a trend before, then you know that the effect you have after the treatment could be due to the trend and not due to the treatment. That's sort of the idea. In this, the parallel trend assumption is a little more complicated. It's not just parallel trend, it's a certain functional form. And we tested for that. Okay, but it's a little more common. I don't want to put it up, but it's sort of similar because it's, it's rather than a parallel trend, it's like a plane, you know, and you can test for it. What I'm not sure though, I'm in her paper is, is there some, because in the end we're using small sample, all that holds in, in what they call, in, you know, to the limit. But in practice, you're not, theoretically it converges. But in practice, you've got small samples. So that's one part, but it satisfies. It. So. Uh, no, no, what? So it's not staggered treatment. So there's, uh, I think that's what you're asking, right? So there's that JFP paper by, I forgot who, but recently where the, if you have <laughs> continuous treatments, then the standard DID will not, you have to modify. Right? This is one shot. So that doesn't apply to us, right? It's 2010. It's not 2011 is another shot, 2012. So it's called staggered uh, DID. Okay. Because if it's a staggered DID, you have to use those methods. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
there are three questions that we should. Sure. I don't know if um, that was raised with us being there or not. But, um, one question is how are you defining free beta to be one and zero? What is the criteria? Okay, so just keep as I explained to you, one is greater than median, one is you know, below median, but if you don't do it as two groups, you can do the same methodology as a continuous and you get the same results. There's a more longer question. Okay. Let me read it out. Okay. Say on pay mandate, uh, which is also part of the DF, is uh, bound to increase the pay performance sensitivity. Uh, hence, uh, can it be interfering card? Also, was any effect on severance contracts so third in addition to bonus rsu that others mentioned okay so the thing about say on pay just happens to be not in banks i have i have a paper on and it got published it's a very weird construct so what is say on pay say on pay is the they put it to a vote and my paper was just showing that even though on paper people are voting, it's as good as when do you get a negative vote? One variable explains it the most, negative returns. So there's all this talk about like shareholders are watching clearly and all. No, if there's negative returns, they hate your pay. There's going to be a negative vote so from what is called institutional shareholders, et cetera. So uh, ISS, right, institutional shareholder services. So I don't think say on pay really, unless the bank's going really bad in performance, it is going to affect any of the results. The other question is about Delta. I told you what the problem is. We know, you know, so pay performance sensitivity is delta. So in some sense, I'm saying we've done some tests saying pre-delta, but I, I don't know. In my heart of hearts, I think anytime you use Vega lurking behind is delta. Anytime you use delta lurking behind is Vega. <laughs> and because it's very highly correlated. I think that's it. Actual, actual, yeah, actual volatility. We didn't use implied from Black Shows, I think, yeah. I, you know, but I don't think it'll change. The, the, you know, every volatility measure we use, these results are strong. Every performance measure is used. That's why I said in the beginning itself, uh, so there's certain things in different papers you go like, this is not so robust. Sometimes this, sometimes this. Here it comes up very clearly. And the question is why? That's the biggest problem of this paper is why this returns. And I think looking at the, that they're playing with the asset side might be, you know, something we have to think about. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for your good comments. I think there is something to take away for all of us. Yeah. <laughs>